VOA1, the hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners. So we speak a little slower, and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from Jill Robbins, Susan Shand, and John Russell. Later, Katie Weaver and Ashley will bring us the next part in our series on America's National Parks. But first... Dr. Beach, a self-described coastal expert, has named Hapuna Beach of Hawaii as the best beach in the United States for 2021. In his yearly ranking of the best beaches, he said Hapuna Beach, with its white sand and black lava rocks, is a perfect place to swim, snorkel, or scuba dive. On big wave days, Try the boogie boards, he added. Visitors to Hawaii and its beaches, however, are required to get tested for COVID-19, whether they are vaccinated or not. Hawaii is a really special place, and so I think it's worth it, he told the Associated Press. Candy Miranda owns Manuela Malasada Company and runs a food truck near Hapuna Beach State Park. Born and raised on the Big Island of Hawaii, she was able to stay open for locals throughout the pandemic and is hopeful about the return of visitors. Miranda described Hapuna Beach as magical. She added, The ocean in general in our culture is a really powerful place. Dr. Beach is also known as Stephen Leatherman, a professor at Florida International University. Leatherman has reviewed and rated beaches around the world for over 30 years. Leatherman uses 50 criteria to come up with his yearly lists. They include cleanliness, smell, sand quality, water temperature, and safety. Recently, Leatherman has added a new one on whether smoking is permitted on the beach. First of all, it's a health issue, he said, of cigarette smoke. And he worried that people would leave cigarette waste on beaches. The other top beaches on this year's list include Duke Kahanamoku Beach in Hawaii and Cooper's Beach in New York. There are two in the state of Florida, St. George Island State Park and Caladesi Island State Park. To the north on the Atlantic coast are Beach Walker Park in South Carolina and Ocracoke Lifeguarded Beach and Lighthouse Beach in North Carolina. Others include Coronado Beach in San Diego, California, and Coast Guard Beach in Cape Cod, Massachusetts. No matter what beach is on your list, Leatherman advises beachgoers to observe social distancing at all times. He also says to bring along sun protection and, yes, cloth face coverings. Zimbabwean farmers are again growing tobacco. But some say it is lenders who are profiting by placing farmers in debt. Rosemary Joja is a small farmer who recently traveled 200 kilometers to the capital, Harare. She brought her tobacco crop for what she hoped would be a profitable day. But the 60-year-old farmer ended up sleeping out in the open for two weeks waiting for her payment. When the money arrived, it was just a small part of what her tobacco sold for later. 
she was angry. My tobacco sold for seven thousand dollars, but I am only going home with less than four hundred dollars, she said. The rest of the money went to the merchant who had given her a loan to pay for fertilizer, seed, labor, firewood, and goods for her home. Joja had to repay the loan with interest and sell her crop to the merchant at a set price. The merchant then sold the tobacco to the highest bidder in a public sale. Often, the highest price is paid by buyers who will export the crop to China. Tobacco was a profitable crop in Zimbabwe for more than 60 years. White farmers profited during this time. When former President Robert Mugabe's supporters began violently taking over white-owned farms, tobacco production fell. The tobacco crop dropped from 260 million kilograms in 1998 to 50 million kilograms in 2008. Since then, tobacco production by black farmers has grown. The number of black growers, mainly on small farms, has risen to more than 145,000. Experts estimate that this year's tobacco crop will be 200 million kilograms. That is up from 180 million kilograms last year. Zimbabwe's banks used to give loans to white farmers for tobacco growing. But the banks pulled out years ago because the government has not provided deeds to the black farmers on formerly white-owned land. Deeds are documents that show ownership of land or property. The merchant loans helped black farmers get involved in the tobacco industry. The demand started with Chinese buyers, but now many Zimbabwean merchants want to profit from it. The Tobacco Market Industry Board supervises the tobacco industry in Zimbabwe. It says, 96% of tobacco farmers have been financed by the loan contracts. This year, the Tobacco Industry Marketing Board released 20,000 farmers from contracts with merchants. Many say this system has helped Zimbabwe bring the tobacco industry back to life and become Africa's biggest grower of the crop. But many black farmers say the merchants are making them poor. George Seremwe is the president of the Tobacco Association of Zimbabwe. He said that farmers are always in debt because as soon as they repay a loan, they have to take out another one. Year in and year out, they are in debt, he said. He said that some farmers lose animals, their only wealth, to merchants after failing to repay loans because of poor harvest. A study in the publication Tobacco Control found that more than 90% of tobacco farmers want to end their contracts but cannot find other ways to raise money. The study found that close to 60% of farmers said they were in debt. Economist John Robertson said, The problem is that farmers who took over white-owned land are not able to borrow from banks. He said banks fear that if a farmer fails to repay a loan, they cannot sell the farmer's land to cover the cost because ownership of the land is unclear. The government says the answer lies with the state-owned land bank, started in April. It says the bank would loan farmers money for their tobacco crops at lower interest rates. I'm Jill Robbins. Visiting another country, you will need a passport and probably a digital vaccination document. Hoping to restore international travel, the European Union, some Asian governments, and the airline industry want to create a vaccine passport. They are working on systems for travelers to use phone apps to prove they have been vaccinated. This will help travelers avoid local quarantine requirements when they arrive. 
The various efforts, however, show the lack of a central international system to check on vaccinations, either electronically or with paper documents. There are also questions about privacy and vaccine inequality. But many countries want them. The European Union, EU, and countries like Iceland have opened their borders to vaccinated visitors. Saudi Arabia will soon start permitting its vaccinated citizens to travel to foreign countries. Here is a look at how vaccine passports might work. The EU, China, and Japan are working on their own digital vaccination documents for international travel. Britain updated its National Health Service app last week to let travelers prove they have been fully vaccinated. It comes just as travel rules are easing. The EU is testing a digital document to confirm COVID-19 test results or recovery from the virus. It is to start by the end of June. It is still unclear where and how exactly travelers in the EU will have their vaccine documents checked, since there are no borders. Officials in Brussels say that question will be decided by each country. The idea is that travelers will show a QR code on their phones, so it can be inspected at an airport or train station. Officials will check it against national databases. Travelers also need a phone app to show an official vaccination document. The EU's project includes free technology European countries can use to build their official documents. The airline industry organization, the International Air Transport Association, has its own IATA travel pass. Airlines including Qantas, Japan Airlines, Emirates, British Airways, and Virgin Atlantic have agreed to use the app. Common Pass is another app being used by Cathay Pacific, JetBlue, United, and Lufthansa. Right now, Travel Pass and Common Pass are only available to travelers on airlines that are using them. Both can be used with airline travel apps, so users can show they have been vaccinated when they check in online. Both also plan to be used with EU vaccine documents. Common Pass says users will be able to put in their vaccine information by mid-June. Common Pass head Paul Mayer said vaccine passports will only become more common. Our expectation is it will remain a requirement for international travel, he said. Business travelers seem to like the idea of vaccine passports. Imeric Seagard is head of Geneva-based private jet company Lunajets. He believes vaccine passports will put an end to taking many COVID-19 tests while traveling. And he is not concerned with the possibility that vaccine documents might include personal information. I would be happy to tell anybody, yes, I am vaccinated, or no, I am not vaccinated, he said. Digital vaccination documents would be hard to falsify, unlike paper documents. IATA says it does not verify COVID-19 test results or whether travelers have been vaccinated. The organization adds that it will match travelers with their personal information of testing and vaccination sent from registered labs. There are checks to prevent identity theft. I'm Susan Shand. Memorial Day is an American holiday that honors the memory of people who died while serving in the U.S. military. This year, 
It will be celebrated on Monday, May 31st. You might read or hear about Memorial Day ceremonies in the United States. The American president, for example, often gives a speech. In today's Everyday Grammar, we will explore the connection between Memorial Day, grammar, and speeches. It might sound strange to you, but ceremonies can teach you a lot about the English language, particularly verbs and adjectives. Let's start our report with part of a speech given by former President Ronald Reagan in 1984. Reagan uses terms such as recall, which means to remember, and words such as valor, meaning bravery or courage. My, my fellow Americans, Memorial Day is a day of ceremonies and speeches. Throughout America today, we honor the dead of our wars. We recall their valor and their sacrifices. We remember they gave their lives so that others might live. A few verbs, honor, recall, remember, play an important part in Reagan's speech. These verbs are all in the simple form. English has several verb forms. The simple and the progressive are two of them. English speakers are more likely to use the simple form than the progressive form, particularly in speaking. So, you are more likely to hear we honor instead of we are honoring, or we recall instead of we are recalling. Specifically, Reagan used what is called the simple present, the simple form of the verb in the present. But the so-called simple present does not always line up exactly with the present time. Reagan uses the simple present to describe something that is generally true about Memorial Day. He is not exactly talking about only the present moment in time. This idea is somewhat difficult, and it raises an important issue. English verb forms, sometimes called tenses in grammar books, do not always cleanly line up with exact points in time. Another Memorial Day speech, given in 1914 by former President Woodrow Wilson, can teach us about some of the language choices American presidents often make when giving speeches. Wilson suggested that Americans are sometimes known to be careless in their choice of words. He added, Yet it is interesting to note that there are some words about which we are very careful. As an example, Wilson said Americans use the adjective great in many different situations. But, he added, there is another word Americans are very careful to use, the adjective noble. We never call a man noble who serves only himself, Wilson said. Many other American presidents have been careful in using noble in their Memorial Day speeches as well. For example, Reagan, in the same 1984 speech from earlier in this report, said the following, A grateful nation opens her heart today in gratitude for their sacrifice, for their courage, and for their noble service. Although today's report discussed American presidents, speeches, and language choices, you can use the general ideas in many different situations. For example, think of a ceremony or remembrance in your own country. Think about what kinds of verbs and adjectives speakers of your language use in that situation. Then compare your own language to the kinds of choices that English speakers might make. And although the idea of Memorial Day is serious, 
you can use some of the ideas you learned today to talk about fun, light-hearted celebrations. Think of how to use the simple present to talk about activities that usually take place on that day. And think about specific adjectives that are correct for the event. I'm John Russell. The state of Utah is home to five major national parks. They are among the most famous parks in the United States. Our national parks journey brings us to the southeastern part of the state. Here you will find narrow canyons, steep cliffs, and hidden river valleys. Welcome to Zion National Park. Zion sits within a desert landscape. The 260-kilometer-long Virgin River runs through it. It provides water for more than 1,000 kinds of plants to grow and over 100 kinds of animals to live including the desert tortoise, desert bighorn sheep, and mountain lions. River water has also carved out the area's spectacular canyons and gorges. One of them, called Zion Canyon, stretches more than 20 kilometers through the park. In some places, it is more than 600 meters deep. At its most narrow point, it is just 6 meters across. Zion is one of the 10 most visited parks in the country. Travelers from America and around the world come here to explore its canyons climb its steep walls, and walk its dramatic trails. Zion's extraordinary beauty affected early Mormon settlers. Members of the religious group came to the area beginning in the 1850s. They thought it looked like heaven, they named the land after a place from the Bible, Zion. Zion means sanctuary or refuge in ancient Hebrew. Mormons were not, of course, the first people to explore the area. Experts say humans first arrived around 12,000 years ago. They hunted very large animals, like mammoths, giant sloths, and camels. Climate change and overhunting caused these animals to die out about 8,000 years ago. Humans changed their methods. They hunted smaller animals and gathered other food. Some 2,000 years ago, a culture centered on what we now call Zion began to form. Scientists know these people as the Virgin Anasazi. They settled in the area and grew crops. They used the water from the Virgin River and depended on the rich diversity of native plants and animals. Over time, many Native American groups called the area home, including the Southern Paiute. The Southern Paiutes called the area Makuntuweep. In their language, the name meant Straight Canyon. The United States Congress moved to protect the area beginning in the early 1900s. In 1909, 
it became a national monument. It was called Makuntuweep National Monument. President William Taft established the national monument. He described the land as a labyrinth of remarkable canyons with highly ornate and beautifully colored walls, in which are plainly recorded the geological events of past ages. In 1918, the National Monument became a national park. And in 1919, Congress changed its name to Zion, the name used by the Mormons. Today, almost three million people visit Zion National Park each year. Driving is restricted in much of the park during busy months. Instead, visitors travel in small buses that take them to areas where they can walk on paths into the wild areas. Walking is the best way to explore Zion. The park offers visitors many different kinds of paths. Some are short and easy. One easy walk is almost two kilometers. It takes hikers to a clear pool of water and waterfalls. Other hikes take most people all day to complete. Some are not advisable for people who are afraid of high places. A hike called Angel's Landing is considered one of the most exciting hikes in America. The trail leads to the top of a rock formation that stands more than 450 meters above the canyon floor. Toward the top of the rock, the walking path becomes extremely narrow. On both sides are very steep cliffs. Hikers can hold on to a rope for increased safety. Most hikers say the views from Angel's Landing make the difficult and dangerous experience worth it. Some visitors favor the lower parts of Zion National Park. One popular area is known as the Narrows. The Narrows is the narrowest part of Zion Canyon. The area has extremely tall canyon walls and unusual hanging gardens. These green areas of wildflowers, ferns, and mosses grow out of the sandstone walls. If you want to explore the Narrows, you must be ready to get wet. Hiking in the Narrows means walking next to, and even in, the Virgin River. If water levels are high, walking in the river can be extremely difficult. Sometimes, hikers may be waist-high in water. Even near the canyon floor, hikes at Zion can be dangerous. The great amount of rock in the area does not absorb water. As a result, sudden floods, called flash floods, are a serious threat. People can help prepare themselves as much as possible for the dangers of Zion National Park at the Visitor's Center. But the risks come with great rewards. I'm Katie Weaver. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson.